Last point, um, in didactic bargaining, quote, concession aversion leads to a greater tendency on both sides to risk the consequences of non-agreement or deadlock, and hence a lower probability of negotiated agreements. So on, I'm not going to get in a, too much detail on uh, international negotiations, it gets far too complicated, but um, didactic bargaining is basic, basically the point. Imagine that, and I, I should have thought of uh, an example, imagine that, um, imagine that I am attempting to bargain something where there's going to have to be concessions on both parts. So it's, let's think, um, there's a labor, I should have thought of an example, let's say there's a labor disputes, right? Employer um, could potentially lose more money because, okay, that would be good, right? This is classic, right? So employer could potentially lose more money because the employer has to increase um, pay. So there's a potential loss in revenue because there is a demand for an increase in pay. In pay. Okay, so the, 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 the employer is going to be risk-seeking with respect to those losses, right? I'm going to risk more because I don't want to lose. Now, with respect to the employees, imagine that um, insofar as I'm making demands for more money as a gain, um, imagine that one of the conditions of the negotiation would be, well, you know, productivity is going to be higher, right? So if I'm going to pay you more money, I'm going to expect you to be more productive. I expect greater output, I'm going to increase quota. So if we're going to have this negotiation, you're going to have to increase quota. What's going to end up happening is that negotiation is this sort of didactic bargaining with respect to concession aversion, to be technical, is going to unfold probably in gridlock. An experienced negotiator would recognize that this is going to be problematic, right? Because what's going to end up happening is the, the, um, the employer is not going to be willing to give up extra money and the, the uh, labor force is not going to be willing to increase demand because one person's increase is my deficit, right? I look at, as a laborer, um, an increase in demand as a deficit because now I'm working, I'm working harder, right? There's a higher quota that has to be met. So the advantage for the uh, employer being increased demand is my deficit, right? So there's going to be, um, there's going to be um, an aversion, right? There's going to be an aversion to that. For the labor group, um, the, dem the, the demand to have an increase in pay is obviously going to be uh, a disadvantage for the, for the laborers. I mean, not for the laborers, for the employers, right? So, again, to read this, just so that uh, you have an idea, concession aversion leads to, quote, a greater tendency on both sides, right, on both sides, to risk the consequences of non-agreement or deadlock. Non-agreement or deadlock would be sort of like this idea, right? This would be represented by, like, deadlock, right? Not agreement or deadlock, rather than um, both sort of finding the middle of what an equal concession might be, right? An equal concession. I'll give up this if you give up that, um, and we'll, we'll attain some middle ground insofar as there's concessions made on both parties. And that's very, uh, it's very rare that those forms of negotiation work. Usually what ends up happening is uh, both parties perceive any concession, obviously, because we're going to be risk-seeking with respect to our losses. Both parties are going to say, no, I want this, right? I want this. I want this. I, I don't want it to change. I want to remain how it is, right? Um, um, I want it to be to my advantage and not to their advantage. I don't want to lose and they not lose. I don't care if they're losing, right? It's about my loss, not your loss, and, and so on. Um, so, um, pretty, pretty, pretty dense pretty dense uh, lecture. Key points, I just want to sort of recap because it's been a lot of stuff and I'm um, giving a lot of information. Key points for sort of prospect theory and the application of prospect theory at an international level. First key point, prospect theory is uh, a theory that attempts to describe human behavior and human decision making with respect to risk taking and risk and loss and gains, right? So risk gains decision-making. That's basically it. 
How does it apply to the individual? Individuals are risk averse with respect to gains. What does that mean? If you can guarantee me something, it's more likely that I'll go for the guarantee rather than risk anything, generally speaking. Individuals are risk seeking with respect to losses. What does that mean? It means if there is a likelihood that I will definitely have to relinquish something, then it's more likely that I'll, I'll attempt to relinquish far more and preserve what I already have. Right, so I'll be risk seeking with respect to losses. How do those ideas apply to international, sort of international level? I gave a, a number. Um, with respect to the relationship between a candidate and his, con or his or her constituency, candidates often will sort of preach to the choir. They will attempt to pacify um, entrenched partisans, which is a waste of time, right? Because they are fearful that they will lose that constituent rather than attempting to gain new constituents. They'll be risk averse with respect to gains, but they will be risk seeking with respect to losses. And I gave examples of that. Um, another example um, has to do with, um, just and the last example has to do with sort of territorial encroachment in international war as a consequence of territorial encroachment. In territorial encroach encroachment, um, the, the state that is encroaching um, is gaining, obviously, and there's a certain amount of risk that's gain that's built into gaining, and I didn't get into more of the technicalities. The state that is being encroached upon is going to perceive that encroachment as far greater, right? There's more weight placed on the invasion. Um, once, assuming that the land has been invaded, you're going to have a state of affairs where both parties are going to interpret that um, as risk loss, right? I don't want to lose what I already have. I want to gain back what you took from me, and then obviously the conflict is going to escalate. So hopefully that is uh, hopefully that's clear, and you have an understanding of the application of prospect theory to international uh, relations, politics, and uh, international discourse. Uh, with that being said, I want to thank you for watching my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.